My name is Alan Fries. In the fall of 1962, I arrived on the campus of the University of California at Berkeley to begin my graduate studies in hydrogeology. It was my great good fortune to meet and study under Paul Witherspoon. At that time, a young, up-and-coming professor with a background in petroleum engineering who had decided to turn his attention to groundwater. Now, 45 years later, I am back at Berkeley to interview Paul on his illustrious career as part of the Hydrogeology Time Capsule Series. The idea of a series of interviews with the influential hydrogeologists of our time was originated by Craig Simmons of Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia, and Philippe Renard of the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. The program is sponsored by the International Association of Hydrogeologists, and additional funding has been provided for today's interview by the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Well, I thought we'd start at the beginning and All ask right. you a few questions about your, your childhood and youth. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, February 9th, 1919. And uh, my parents were living in a suburb of Pittsburgh known as Dormont, where I went to grade school and high school, and then on to the University of Pittsburgh in uh, January, yeah, I think 1933, I believe that's the time. Now, now what did your dad do and what uh, was your early life like in your family and so on? Dad was a civil engineer and then during World War I, he worked for the Carnegie Coal Company and uh, kept track of how the coal was being removed and so forth. And, uh, so he had a lot of experience in the underground, which was one of the things I later learned was a good idea. And uh, then he decided to form his own company to look for natural gas in the Pittsburgh area. So he bought a cable tool drilling rig, which is an old fashioned method of drilling wells and uh, was quite successful in locating certain gas deposits. During some, two summer sessions, he wanted me to get some experience, so I became what is called a tool dresser on this cable tool rig of only two men, 12 hour days, six days a week. And it was really hard labor. One of the toughest things to do was to dress the drilling bit, that is to bring it back to the size of the hole you were trying to drill. Yeah, and uh, the uh, this required a forge where the the bit could be heated up to a white heat, and then brought out on an anvil, and then the driller and the tool dresser would together in unison begin to bring this bit back to its normal dr drilling size. And but there was a, some dangers involved here because. There are little pockets of gas in some of these sands. And as you're drilling along under normal conditions, if you hit, seem to hit a gas pocket, it'll come up through the drilling fluids in the hole and there'll be a certain noise develop. The driller can tell exactly. This just means a puff of gas is on its way to the surface. And one afternoon when I was near the uh, forge, getting him a bit, re almost ready to pull out and put on the anvil. The driller said, Paul, run over and turn off the gas and pour water on that uh, forge and the bit as fast as you possibly can, which meant that steam was then all over the rig floor. And within about five minutes, here came a puff of gas that uh, if we had had the bit out and were banging away on it, sparks would be flying, the noise would be tremendous. You might not hear this <coughs> change that the driller had caught because of his, his experience. <coughs> I had a great deal of respect for that man from then on. 
So, so your long and illustrious career could have been much shorter, uh, <laughs> starting right about then. Exactly. So did, did that work uh, right out on the rig? Did that sort of influence your decision to get into petroleum engineering when you went away to college? Yes, absolutely. Dad, Dad also was studying geology because he was trying to find out where should he drill. So that gave me the idea that this petroleum engineering, which I could take out at the University of Pittsburgh, would be a, a, a good thing to go after. So you went to the University of Pittsburgh for your undergraduate uh, right. degree. Started in January of uh, 37, I believe, and finished in June 1st, 1941. Okay. And uh, anything uh, influential in your, your you know, college years that uh, got you, uh, you know, going in the directions that you ultimately went? or? Did that happen in later life? That, that was, that was a, later on. Uh, well, I, I should go on <clears throat> to say that uh, having graduated June 1st, 1941, I had a job with the Phillips Petroleum Company and had to report to them out in Oklahoma City in an old oil field. And, and so, so I did that, but by December 7th, 1941, the Japanese had uh, bombed Pearl Harbor and declared war on the United States. And so Phillips had been uh, negotiating with the government to take the enormous sources of butane out in the Borger, Texas area. And they had been looking for a process to convert that into butadiene, which you can use in synthetic rubber. Mm -hmm. So Phillips got a a very special contract to go after synthetic rubber, and I was trans transferred to Bartlesville, the head office for Phillips, uh, where we were to design, construct, and put into operation a butadiene plant during the war years as fast as possible. So you, you didn't serve in the armed forces, you were deferred because you were working on this yes. uh, in, at the Every six months I got a deferment and uh, I was finally transferred to the field offices to help get the plant in operation and did that to the, through to the end of the war. So you, after the war then you ended up in Bartlesville and that's where you met Elizabeth, I understand? Yes, that's right. We got married in October 13th, uh, 1946. And how long have you been married? <laughs> Well, that makes it about 60, 61 years. 61 years. Very nice. Uh, so how did you get back to grad school? So you were, you were working then in the oil patch, essentially, with your undergraduate degree. What made you decide to go back to school? Or, well, Phillips, we were, got married, and, and uh, shortly after that, uh, the company transferred us up to a little cow town in eastern Kansas called Eureka. And uh, I went up there as a reservoir engineer to study the petroleum reservoirs and so forth. And as I began to dig into the details of that, it began to occur to me that I needed more but good background in geology and mathematics. So I discussed this with my wife and, and told her I felt like I, I needed to get back to graduate school. And her, her uh, reply was typical, how soon can we leave? <laughs> so uh, the, we, we, what I did then was to take leave from Phillips and in the fall of uh, 49, moved up to Lawrence, Kansas. We weren't too far away and moved into the Department of Petroleum Engineering up there and took a job, paid $1,100 in nine months, where I would help the faculty in the laboratory process like that. And that way I could work on my master's degree in petroleum engineering. And then uh, after that you went to the Illinois State Geological Survey and uh, how did that come about? Or, uh... Well, that was just a friendship of the Kansas State Geological Chief. He told me one day, before I quite finished the degree, 
that the Illinois State Geological Survey had a position open for a petroleum engineer to take over in that division. So I contacted the Illinois Survey, sent them in all my records and so forth, and they were, decided they would have me join them in Urbana. And uh, so I could also then pursue a PhD while having a full-time job with the Illinois Geological Survey. So you were juggling a job and school and parenthood and marriage and it was a it was a jo quite a quite a few things to do absolutely. Yeah. So did you maintain then a, a more or less full time job during the period you were working on your PhD? Yes, uh, the uh, I talked to the the head of the Department of Geology, and he gave me a the kind of courses he thought I ought to take to supplement what I'd gotten in petroleum engineering. And then I talked to the head of the Illinois State Geological Survey and he said, fine, you can pursue that provided you just make up for whatever courses you, uh, whatever classes you can't get to because of some field work or whatever. As long as you maintain a 40 hour week, you can go right ahead and continue to pursue a PhD. Wow. So what kind of courses did you, was that still basically in petroleum engineering or well, on your PhD? The, the, they didn't have a petroleum engineering uh, degree at Illinois, but of course they had all the geology courses and I had a, quite a few of those to take. But I'd also been looking at some of the crude oils in Illinois and began to wonder what it was was there, were there any colloidal uh, substances in these crude oils that would be of interest from the standpoint of how do you maximize your recovery of this crude oil? So I took some courses in physical chemistry where I got acquainted with colloidal chemistry. And the Depart Department in Physical Chemistry at Illinois had a ultra centrifuge, a device that can spin fluids with uh, isolated particles in them at such high speeds that if these particles are very, very small, they will be seen to migrate in a very, very low velocity from which you can compute their density, their size, and so forth. So I learned a little bit of using ultra centrifugation mm -hmm. to get a better understanding of Illinois crude oil. And did this become your PhD thesis topic? Or? And, and, and the Department of Geology at Illinois allowed me to get a PhD in physical chemistry studying the colloidal behavior of crude oil. Now I know you've told me that uh, uh, Ralph Grimm was one of your earliest sort of influences. Uh, he was at Illinois at this time, was he? Or? That's right. Yeah. Ralph Grimm, of course, was a world authority on clay minerals. And at one time I had thought about the possibility of seeing how do clay minerals that are also in oil sands, how do they influence the migration of fluids through the uh, sandstone. But when I told Grimm what I was doing, he said, well, you just keep on going after the colloidal behavior. And I wound up then with a, with a degree in the, uh, the colloidal nature of petroleum. Now, did his style of uh, interacting with you and other students influenced the way you interacted with us when we uh, yeah. showed up as your students? And that's a good question. I, I, I really never met such a gentle person who was knowledgeable, of course, a leader, an author, international authority, and yet so easy to get along with. It was, it was marvelous to see how this man succeeded. Well, that fits, I think, your students' feelings about you as well. So I wondered if that kind of comes down the generations. And I, I hope I did the same with my students after I learned how to yeah. do it from you. I think it yeah. had a distinct influence. So anyway, uh, following your PhD, you, you made it out to Berkeley. Now, how did that come about? Well, I was, uh, and that would be 1956, I learned of a position that was just been announced here at Berkeley in the Department of Petroleum Engineering. Well, it was actually the Department of Mineral Technology here at, here at Berkeley. 
uh, they, they advertised this job in petroleum engineering. They needed a, a, someone to teach petroleum engineering, so I sent all my uh, background and uh, co courses and so forth out here. And very shortly, I received a phone call. Could I come out to Berkeley for an interview and bring my bring my wife? And so in April 1956, the degree was not yet finished. We came out here to Berkeley and looked over the mineral, Department of Mineral Technology, had some very productive meetings. And the department is, <coughs> decided they would they would hire me for this position, provided I could complete the thesis by January 57, which we ultimately did. And we arrived in Berkeley then in January of 1957, having completed the degree at the University of Illinois. And your, your first few years at Berkeley then, you were in the petroleum engineering group. And yes. continued to work on uh, petroleum topics. Like, what what was your main uh, early well, career uh, research career, if you want? It was mainly the conditions that would be controlling the flow of crude oil, or mixtures of crude oil and water through porous media topics okay. of, of that kind. But uh, one thing one thing I should mention that when I was working at the Illinois State Geological Survey. I had the good fortune to uh, see a, the first aquifer gas storage project ever ever used in, in the United States that was going to be put in operation in Illinois, not far from Chicago. The idea was to store gas from a pipeline in the summer months and drag it out in the winter months when there was a cold snap coming out of the Rocky Mountains into the Chicago area. And th this company went ahead and developed a, a very large project beneath the village of Hersher. Hersher, Illinois is about 100 miles from Chicago. And th then they began to inject natural gas of about 1,600 feet below the surface in a w water sand, because this was an aquifer, a water-filled series of sands and so forth. And of course, they, they had no experience to call them because there hadn't been a project of this size trying to use a water-filled sand for gas storage. That was a new technology that has since proven to be a very excellent way to store natural gas. So the gas had to be pumped in and displace the water, so to speak. Right. And, it, it, much, and you yeah. just had to keep it from going out the, the edges of the structure. If you knew the size of the structure and its geometry, there were ways of pumping the gas in at the crest and not to let it go too far down the sides of the structure where it might escape. But it, uh, the only, only petroleum techniques were available at that time. And what was your role in that uh, project I, at Hersher? Uh, that, that, at that time, while I was a state employee, I simply was to observe and, and report back to the survey how this project was starting and so forth. Okay. It turns out that they injected quite a bit of gas within about a month in 19, uh, see, 1956, uh, no, 50. Early 50s anyway. Yeah. Early 50s. And uh, within a short period of time, uh, a, a farm water well began to produce gas. Oh. Uh, only had water. The village of Hersher had, had at one time had a series of hand, hand pump, water pump, water wells in their backyards. Of about 35 of these, they started to spew up water and gas. And then there had been a little bit of uh, exploration for oil in the region of Hersher. Even the old oil wells had been improperly plugged and they had to be opened up and re-completed. In other words, gas was coming up almost everywhere. It was a, a, a real tough problem for the company. And I was able to witness all of this, this kind of uh, uh, results on a very new and important 
technology like gas storage. So this, I suppose, led into your early research in looking at uh, cap rocks for, for gas storage yeah, projects absolutely. that you were doing at, when I came to Berkeley, I know that was one of your major yeah. major projects. with that, the, uh, that, the way in which hydrogeologists had studied rocks could be, could be used, and, and then I, one, one needed to know, was there a good cap rock over this structure? The yeah. structure might be visualized as a, a bowl, inverted bowl. And was there a good cap rock just above the storage zone that would prevent the gas from leaking out, getting up to the surface? I think one of the things that people who watch this tape will be most interested in is how, the, how you went from sort of petroleum engineering into groundwater studies and I gather it had to do with this, this was kind of the linchpin yeah. project, was it? Yeah. Where, where you started to apply or look at some of the groundwater techniques? Yeah, it, it became quite obvious that uh, if, if aquifer gas storage was really going to be of economic value, one would have to know what's the nature of the, uh, the cap rock some, that would prevent these enormous leakage problems. and. Uh, so I had that as a background. I began to do some consulting along these lines after I got to Berkeley because I wanted to help the uh, several Illinois companies decide that they would also try this. And in fact, a whole host of uh, gas companies who store gas in the vicinity of Chicago and get, get it in and out uh, began to look at aquifers and I could help them uh, using groundwater technology to uh, decide whether such and such project would be okay or whether the cap rock wasn't quite right, or things of that nature. Yeah. But what made you realize that there was a chance to sort of translate material between the two fields? Was that common, do you think? Were others doing the same thing, or was that uh, something that you realized? Uh, well, so, some of the technology came right out of petroleum technology. Yeah. But we had to develop some new uh, techniques because they, they didn't occur in producing oil and gas in, in the normal fashion. Mm -hmm. And it all had it all, all to do with, with it was the, uh, the nature of this cap rock. That was one of the big questions. Yeah. So the, we, we were doing that, when, and the American Gas Association found out about our work looking at cap rock problems. And they came to Berkeley and asked me if I would prepare a uh, book that would summarize the methods that had been developed in hydrogeology and could be put in petroleum lingo rather than the lingo used by the hydrologists. They didn't all have the same units and mm -hmm. terms and so forth. So we had a two-year project and three of my graduate students, one of which was yourself, and two of your colleagues, Dr. Uh, Chavandel and Dr. Norman. And the three students and I then worked out a summary that was then used by the American Gas Association throughout all of the uh, gas, gas storage operations in the, in the United States. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, uh, of course, I have very fond memories of the three of us working together with you during those years, uh, Shlomo Neumann and Iraj Javandal and myself. Uh, was it just kind of serendipity that we all got there at the same time, all from three different countries? Uh, as far it, as I can tell, yeah, you, you didn't. I, was, I wasn't very well known at that time. and. Uh, of course, to have three really first-rate students ready and willing to work on a project of this kind was a, a real bonanza as far as I was concerned. Well, and of course it provided support for us to allow us to yeah. hang around. <laughs> it was good times. Uh, you recognized very early the, the power of computers. Uh, you know, maybe people today don't Think back to the computers were first coming in. I know when I came to Berkeley, I hadn't really thought of the fact that I would be, you know, learning how to use uh, computers uh, particularly. How did you realize so much earlier than everybody else that, that this was something we all had? You, you made us all go over there yeah. and take those yeah. math courses and those computer courses and 
Uh, well, it, it just turns out that the, 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 phys the physics of flow of natural gas and water in these storage operations involves some very complicated uh, equations or equations that are supposed to describe the, what is actually taking place. But to solve those problems for meaningful field conditions required some really good first-class math mathematics, more or less well above what would normally be used in the petroleum industry. Mm -hmm. So I, when I found that out, <clears throat> Berkeley had, had some very good courses in the engineering department here. And uh, I, had, I began to tell you fellows, I want you to take so-and-so engineering 230, as I recall, was one of these courses. And, and that's how we, one, one of the, uh, Shlomo Newman went on on his own when, after he completed his degree and went over to uh, Arizona. He continued to even use even more uh, complicated concepts of how to handle these complicated flow problems. And how did you get into the, the you know the finite difference and finite element modeling? Because again, that was just emerging at that point. Uh, you know, what what led you to believe that was something that would be important in groundwater hydrology and, and petroleum? Well, uh, that was that was just part of the mathematics of getting the the right kind of an equation put together, so that when you put in the, the proper mm -hmm. uh, field conditions. You could then solve that problem for different kinds of conditions, and, and then, in other words, you could try to demonstrate what method A might do in the field, or versus method B, and so forth. So it was a way of really digging into the details of what is actually con the controlling factors mm -hmm. in this kind of a complicated flow problem. But you recognize the value of, of this mathematics and particularly this mo these modeling techniques, despite you always told us that you didn't have a strong mathematics background yourself. Right. Uh, I mean, I can remember you used to send us off to take courses and we came back and you made us teach you the, the material that we had yeah. just learned. And I always thought that was a, 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 a was remarkably a big, uh, open way of running a graduate program and we all learned together, kind of, you know? Yeah, it was a big joke. I had one class of just, uh, I think there were four students, something like that. And uh, it turned out I, I picked a topic that I had never been able to study by, on my own as, as I should have. So I, I said, well, I'll try. I got a good book. And I fought my way through maybe chapter one, got things started, and then I started asking each student, would you help me bring up what we need to know for out of chapter two, et cetera, et cetera. So this got to be quite a joke that Witherspoon was teaching, of course, where his students did some of the lectures. I suspect that you may be best known with the work that you did with Shlomo on the leaky aquifer theory, so to speak. Did that all grow out of that uh, gas association Caprock work, or, or how did you realize that there was a need for, for more work to be done in that area, better solutions to come forward? Well, I think Shlomo was the one who was uh, pushing well ahead as he, over at Arizona as he was beginning to get into his career. And I think that was pretty much the work of Shlomo. I was just encouraging him whenever I needed But it kind of grew out of that, uh, that Caprock work you did yeah. for... Uh, on, it for grew, ultimately, it all goes back to this initial work of trying to understand Caprock behavior. Speaking of that, I know that you organized a conference at Monterey. Uh, it was a Penrose conference or a Gordon conference on on low permeability formations. Yeah. And I think that was quite different at that time. Up until that point in time, it's my perception that most groups in the United States were working on aquifers and high permeability geologic formations. And you turned everybody's attention towards thinking about the lower. Yeah. It was, it was a, I was asked to do that by what was the, the, the 
uh, it's now called the Department of Energy, but uh, I was asked by them to, I'd been publishing papers about low permeability, how to, how to work with low permeability rocks. And uh, this, this group came to me and said, would you work up a workshop to be given in, uh, I think we met in Austin for two days. And so I one, uh, got another one of my graduate students, John Gale, and together we developed a program on lo what do you do with low permeability rocks. And uh, at the, on the second day, near the end of this workshop, uh, I found out that I had, had one of the visitors was from Sweden and working with the Swedish nuclear uh, developments in that country. And he came up to me and said, you know, we have an old iron ore mine in central Sweden about uh, oh, 100 miles or so west of, of Stockholm, where the project is going to be terminated because it has reached its economic limit. Do you think the Americans might be interested in, in uh, using that to study the rocks outside of the ore body, because it turned out there was a very good fractured granitic rock on the edges of this old iron ore body. And uh, that, that sounded pretty good. So I w went back and told the DOE people, here's a chance to get underground without having to do, do any mining of our own. The underground works are open. They have, a, they still have a crew that can do whatever work you might need. And would you be interested? And of course, the, our answer was absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, that that got us underground because they, the Swedish people, were able to put out a horizontal uh, hole about five meters in diameter, and. Uh, they drove it out about 100, 100 or 200 meters into the granite. And we could see then that this was a very convenient way. All he had to do is go down the elevator to, I think it was at a depth of 300 meters, go, go out this horizontal drift that we had just constructed and begin research on the rock inside the, that granite rock with all of its fractures. And that turned out that the the fractures have come in sets of one kind or another. They can have all kinds of orientations, but the only way you can really get the details is to get inside that granitic rock. And this kind of inner, I mean, this was a, an example of international cooperation in science that I would think was fairly rare at that time, or, 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 or was it? I, I, I think it was. We had, there was lots of meetings and the results that we were getting out, and, and a, a group of other researchers in this domain uh, took up after we had finished our first one or two years at Stripa. Yes, Stripa, um, Stripa. Yeah. They, they picked up and carried it on for another one or two years. It, it became a very famous cooperative research project in low permeability rocks. Yeah. Now, about this point in your career, I think, is when you sort of moved up onto the hill, as we say, up at the, to the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, did, did, were you both at the university and at the, the lab for a while, or was it a clean break one to the other? No. Uh, I, the, the lab began to realize that, that uh, there were some other sources of energy that one might use to get electricity and so forth. And uh, they, they decided that they would just put out a, a uh, inquiry. Are, are you people at Berkeley interested in, in some of the uh, Ge geothermal systems that, that we, of course, just north of, Sa of San Francisco here, we have a very large geothermal project here in California. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, would you people be willing to start doing some research to see how this might be further expanded by carrying out some careful programs of research on 
the, uh, the, the, ge the geothermal energy. So that, that got us started. Uh, we started with the project up here in, in Nor Northern California. Had other projects with the Mexicans. This would be a new area of research for the for the national labs to be getting into uh, at that time, yeah. I guess, into the alternative yeah. energy sources and energy and environment and was one of the terms they they yeah. used. And so I I was able to get a project for, for them, and we we did most of the work down here in the campus. But uh, as time went on, I could begin, begin to see that th this was something that really needed to be pursued. And and then when Strepa went, went and was producing so much good information needed by almost anybody who was trying to work on the general problem of isolating radioactive waste in the underground, that was the key problem. Mm -hmm. How can you study fractured rocks of low permeability and find out how well will they behave as a method of isolating radioactive waste in the underground. And, and, and that work uh, was primarily f field work and field measurements, or were you also doing work in, in the laboratory and, or even with computers yeah. and so on? It was a kind of a... It, was, it, was, it became a quite bit of general. Everything. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, a com we even brought some cores from the street project all the way to Berkeley, large cores that we could try to, to study some of the problems that we had been working on. And uh, it, 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 then uh, as that progressed rather favorably, the um, lab, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory decided that we had enough work going on that we, they could tur turn this into a division called the Earth, uh, Earth Sciences Division. And I was made the first director of this Earth Sciences Division so that I could try to bring in even more, more people and expand on this general term of energy and, and environment. But you still had students at that time as well, yes. or working on theses uh, and so on? I continued to teach part-time yeah. for uh, quite a while. Would it be fair to say that at that point that Berkeley, the Berkeley community was known as a, probably the main center for working on fractured rock hydrogeology? I would think so. I think it was, yeah. Yeah. One thing I've always been curious about, a lot of the st students and colleagues that you worked with in those years came from other countries. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the fact that the three of us that studied originally under you were from all, all from other countries than the United States, but I... I uh, you know, there's Nari Narasimhan and, and uh, Marcello Lipman and Bo Bodvarsson and Boris Fabyshenko. And, you know, the, you have a long string of yeah. very good people that came from far away. Was that any kind of a plan on your part or did it just happen? Uh, um, I, I, can't, I can't give you a good answer. I mean, you, in this way, you sent a lot of this, this uh, technology out into the world, not just yeah. uh, in, it locked into the U.S. Right. Uh, right. system, which was already perhaps strong. You know, I know it. Well, I also was beginning to do a good bit of travel, so I was going out to many different countries. I remember the Chinese people uh, that I met asked me to come to China for a six-week lecture tour. And one of the fellows that had been a, a postdoc with me, a Chinese student, became the translator. So he understood my kind of English, mm -hmm. American English. And he then proceeded to take, my wife went along, and we traveled to, for six weeks to different uh, institutes in China reviewing all the work we had done with regard to this key question, how do you isolate radioactive waste? So we got all over essentially eastern China. Now I know you also visited Russia quite a bit. Yes. And that was in the sort of the Cold War years. Yes. Uh, how did that come about and what, was you, what were you doing in Russia? Pretty much the same same thing. The, the, uh, there was a, a, a institute of, uh, forget, forget the name of this, technical institute in Moscow where uh, 
some of my friends there were teaching courses more or less along the lines of what I had done, so we, we could compare notes and so forth. That was just another one of the countries that I... How did you make contact initially with the people in these other countries, or did they contact you? There were different ways. They might, they might write me letters of, uh, with certain questions, or we might meet. I was going to a lot of international meetings, so you, you would always be talking to people from Germany or France or, or mm. Russia or, or whatever. It, because the, the, this isolation problem is worldwide. Yes. D did you get satisfaction from your administrative work at LBL, or, or was that something you sort of had well, to do and you really preferred to be yeah. get your hands dirty in the, in the real world? Or? Well, I, I did. I, I, I tried to do what I, could, I uh, had to do, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm not necessarily uh, one of these real uh, authorities when it comes to appropriate methods of management and so, yeah. so forth and so forth. The question of the role of hydrogeology in this nuclear waste isolation uh, business, I mean, do you feel it's a central issue facing uh, nuclear waste isolation? Absolutely, yeah. And There's, a, of course, a, a large number of people who simply don't want to even listen to the problem of putting radioactive waste underground. But the, the work at Yucca Mountain, where the Department of Energy has been working now for quite a number of years, I think has developed an excellent program of understanding the rocks at, at that point and how they will behave under the impact of radioactive waste over long, very long periods of time. I mean, the science can be very complex. Uh, I know that you and I sat on a, a panel at one point looking at the, uh, you know, close to the package kind of uh, physics and chemistry, and, and uh, it's certainly, there's a lot of research left to be done in that area, would you say, for? Oh, I, yeah, well, I think that or, there's or a you, pretty solid picture that's developed, at least for Yucca Mountain. Yeah. Now, there's, a, of course, there are problems similar to this in a lot of other countries. And one of the things I decided to do was just to develop a summary what's going on in, in this topic in about 10 to 15 other countries. Mm -hmm. And we were able from that to put out a uh, review. I think the first one was in 1991. Of, of about about twelve countries, exactly where were they in, in in their efforts in each of their countries to dig up the proper, proper data, yeah. and how did the results in each country sort of compare? So they had a summary that we put out. It went to all of the countries so they could kind of see what's going on around around the nuclear world. And do you think the, the progress in trying to put together all these uh, different fields of science that have to be kind of brought together on that program? I mean, you have the heat flow and the water flow and the fractured rocks and the possible transport of uh, radionuclides and so on. It, do you think that has been brought together to a sufficient level now that uh, people could feel comfortable in, in proceeding? Well, it, 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 still it, has for, it has for Yucca Mountain. Yeah. But there's always... <laughs> a segment of the, in at least he, even here in the United States, of people who just are not quite ready to accept the fact that everything has been done that needs to be done. Now you've always been, a, I know, a very strong supporter of uh, in situ underground testing. Uh, can you tell us why you feel that way, or why you think that's so important? Yeah. Well. It's somewhat the same idea that when you do testing in a borehole, you have certain limitations that you can only get results that are more or less localized around that borehole. Whereas if you go underground, as I described, mm -hmm. and put out large enough adits and drifts and so forth, where you can have a very large scale investigation, 
you're then getting a, a, more, a little closer to what, what, what will the overall behavior of this rock be given a certain, certain conditions of the mm -hmm. kind of waste, how long will it be uh, heating up the rocks and things of that kind. And I know you have led a couple of expert scientific panels for the U.S. nuclear program. Uh, yeah. Anything about those that you well, can they, tell they, us? Well, they were, they were simply trying to pursue that, that kind of an investigation. Has, has the, the things that have already been done at STREPA, are yeah. they enough? Or have we overlooked something uh, uh, that needs to be studied further? Yeah. You've also received uh, many honors for your work over the years. I know that uh, you and Shlomo received the Robert E. Horton Award from the American Geophysical Union and the Oscar Meinzer Award from uh, GSA. Uh, how do you feel about this kind of recognition by your peers? Uh, and well, I'm, I'm very pleased that they, they have uh, responded in the way they, they did. Is there, is there any, uh, any of this kind of recognition you've received in your life that you found particularly uh, sort of a highlight of your career in any way, or are they all just things you're very p proud of? I think the collective, uh, the collective result is uh, what has been a, a point of a long-lasting la long la uh, Satisfaction. Uh, satisfaction, right? yeah. And what about the role of teaching? And I mean, you've been a, a teacher and a mentor to many of us over a long part of our career. That also brought you a lot of satisfaction? And oh, yeah. You, you yeah, enjoy well, teaching? Uh, yes, I. Yeah. It, it, well, the wide range of students from all over the world that have come here to, to uh, study with me it's just been a continuing yeah. uh, activity that, with surprises along the way, special things you, did, you didn't know that needed to be studied. There's always been some surprises somewhere coming up one time or another that you, you just didn't realize or didn't even plan for. Can you give us any examples of things like that that popped up? Uh. I know in my own research that I carried out, you know, under your direction largely, we had lots of things pop up that we weren't expecting, yeah. uh, flow systems that uh, did interesting yeah. things yeah. that uh, hadn't been uh, thought ahead, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you, you, as you progress along, you'll get a certain concept of how such and such geologic situation ought to behave, and then you go out and get some data. Yeah. And find out well. You you really didn't do enough to get the, the proper, complete background. And when you finally did, through further work, you got answers that you ha hadn't even realized might might develop. As you look at the way the field is developing right now, do you think uh, hydrogeology is going in the right directions? I mean, are, do you have any? Uh... Yeah, I I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think. Hydrogeology is, 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 going to be, is going to remain one of the keystone fields of investigation for, for the radioactive waste problems. And what about other problems? What about the climate change issues and so on? Do you think we have a role to play in that field as well? Boy, I think that's going to usher into uh, education as a, a, another really Pro really important uh, problem because if we have sea, sea level rises that people seem to think are definitely going to occur, we all know that most uh, people in almost every country like to live near the sea. Uh, and if the sea rises such that the, the water height sweeps over the land, some areas may be simply flooded. On the other hand, if, if this, the landward, if migration is landward but is underground, 
then you have the problem of c contaminating fresh water supplies that you had planned on using for years to come. Yeah. So, so there's going to be lots of, lots of issues, probably recharge rates and who knows what all. Yeah. And then up in the mountains where you may have developed storage reservoirs, you had to have a source somewhere in that mountain range so that it would be draining and being captured in the storage reservoir. Yeah. Well, if the climate change simply re reduces the rainfall in those areas, then you have the loss of the, the reservoirs not filling up and so forth. There's a host of problems. Yeah. What, what do you see as your sort of greatest legacy to uh, hydrogeology over your career? Well, I think this I, the idea that I've struggled with for quite a while that uh, if, you, if you're trying to develop an understanding of a rock mass that is going to behave the way you need, the way you, 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 it is needed for the benefit of mankind, one has, simply has to get underground, get inside that rock mass, and study it with all the methods that have been worked up over the years because when you're underground, you can do so, so many more things than you can just having a series of boreholes that you mm -hmm. drill from the surface. So there's a, a real need to get inside the rock mass that you are trying to understand and then make all the, uh, the detailed studies yeah. that you should make to get a, a complete understanding of the behavior of that rock mass. I think I'll suggest another one to you, if I may. I, I think when, when Iraj and Shlomo and I started our careers, all the emphasis was on aquifers, high permeability formations. And I think, I think you were really the first one to come along and say, we've got to look at all the other geologic formations too, and especially the low permeability ones that have the, you know, that control these flow systems. And it, it, yeah, you absolutely. Know, that, that, that conference in Monterey and some of those, those are the first conferences that really uh, looked at some of that material, and you, and you were the one that kind of, I think, pushed the field in that direction. Yeah, yeah. And it turned out to be very important in uh, contamination studies, as you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, if you had to do it all over again, would you uh, do anything very differently? <laughs> no, I'm, I think I did pretty much all of it. Well, I, you know, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I really didn't have a long-range plan all worked out well, I, what I was going to do first five years, next five years, and so forth. I sort of tried to realize just how, how well have I got information I need from such and such type of study to go on, because that would suggest, well, you really need to do A, B, and C as additional topics, mm -hmm. so So it, it, it kind of... And it, it, follow your, follow the leads that, that popped up. And of course, in effect, for me to do a stage, say, in industry where I would have a completely different environment to work in would never have allowed me to have the freedom that I've had by getting into a, uh, an environment such as is available here at, at Berkeley and, and the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Yeah. Well, lastly, is there any advice you would uh, pass on to young hydrogeologists and engineers who might be looking at this tape a few years down the road? Well, I, I, I guess I've, I've, what I've been talking about, the, the need to get underground. Don't, don't try to solve tough problems by just drilling wells, which used to be the way you could find oil and gas. Yeah. Very nicely, but that won't work for radioactive waste. So, so even though in, in some ways you may be known best for some of the mathematical and computer things that you did, you emphasize the need to also keep your feet on the ground in the field. Yeah, in the field, and yeah. of course you always want to have it as, as a, a, an assisting uh, effort, the ability of you or your colleagues to carry out whatever mathematical in investigations are needed to understand what does such and such equation really mean yeah. in terms of whatever the project happens to be that you're working on. 
So, Paul, I've enjoyed this very much. I hope, I hope you have too. And uh, uh, I guess we'll thank the International Association of Hydrogeologists for having the foresight to, uh, to put some of these uh, interviews together. And uh, yeah. thanks very much. Mm -hmm.